Thank you very much, Dr. Sagrella. So, you know, again, a couple of key things that we've learned here. Um, when we think about uh, uh, criteria, clinical criteria for severity, remember white counts above 16,000 when the creatinine is elevated, um, when albumin is low in the IBD patient population, those are markers of severity. Um, so what we're going to touch on now are a couple of quick case studies, then we'll finish up with the, um, the uh, audience response questions, and then we'll be all done wrapping things up. All right, so we're going to have something that I think most of you are familiar with, which is um, a young man who has um, ulcerative colitis. So give a little bit of backstory. He's a 19-year-old uh, college student. Um, he was diagnosed with a severe panel sort of colitis at the time of presentation, perhaps a year and a half ago. As per usual, he was treated with steroids, mesalamine products. Ultimately, he did require 6-MP, but didn't quite get into remission, so he was escalated to infliximab, and then steroids were able to taper off. Um, he's been maintained on a regimen of infliximab, five milligrams per kilograms on an eight-week infusion cycle with uh, 6 MP, 50 milligrams daily. And he's going to college a little bit far away. One year later, he has problems. He's developing loose uh, bowel movements. Um, these are waking him up at nighttime, nocturnal bowel movements. Um, bowel movement frequency has gone up from perhaps one to two per day up to eight to 10 per day. And the symptoms have been progressively getting worse over the past three weeks. Starting to get some phone calls coming into the office. Um, nurses are telling you that he is describing a hard time differentiating um, having gas, liquid, and solid bowel movements. He's been having accidents. This is not something college students like to experience. He has also described some weight loss. He's dropped uh, six pounds over the past month. Um, he has not taken antibiotics. So one thing I think everyone has got to be very uh, aware of is that antibiotic exposure will disrupt the flora, and it's the major mechanism for C. diff, inf uh, C. diff infection. But it doesn't necessarily hold true in all of the IBD patient po population. So there's no antibiotics that have been uh, noted in the preceding six months. Um, he's a college student with lots of stressful exams, and he's reaching for ibuprofen on a regular basis um, when he's getting headaches from studying too hard. And he also is admitting to missing a few pills. He's a 19-year-old male. He's busy. But he actually has kept up with the infliximab treatments that were arranged at his college uh, town. Um, patient's going to be coming home in the not-too-distant future, and, but he does definitely want to finish the semester. So... What should we think about doing next? So I'm going to turn to my colleagues here on the panel. So Dr. Frey, um, you're at the Boston University Medical Center. Boston's a college town. I'm sure you're taking care of many of these kids who traveled to Boston and they have their doctors far away in their hometowns. Um, what, what are your thoughts about next steps? Well, again, you pointed out that this is a man who's having a flare of his ulcerative colitis. So you need to kind of bring him into the office if you can, or if you can't bring him into the office, we would fax the lab slips to student health so we can get his CBC, his comprehensive. I want to know what his albumin is. We'll certainly get a CRP and sedrate if those have gone up in the past. And then we would order stool samples. And the question is, which stool samples would you order? Absolutely, positively, you heard from both the ACG and the AGA that this person needs to have a C. diff tested. Now, he's had symptoms for a couple of weeks, so the likelihood that he's going to have a bacterial infection would be very low. So in an effort to make this kid's life a little bit easier and not have him to collect stool in a baggie and transfer it to three different bags, I'm going to do my laboratory test uh, and a C. diff. I'll fax it to his uh, student health. But if he's in town, we'll bring him in the office and assess him. What are his vital signs? What's his, uh, you know, what's his heart rate? And then do these tests to try to figure out if this is a flare of his IBD, if this is a superimposed infection. Uh, again, he is taking his infliximab, so I'm optimistic that he's had relatively good control. And once I determine what's going on, we may do therapeutic drug monitoring, depending on where he is in his uh, cycle. Uh, but those are the, the basics of assessing him. All right, so let's move on to our next slide. So, so we have a request for some blood work, and we're going to be going ahead and getting that blood count, the CBC, a C-reactive protein, the albumin levels. Um, we have some choices here when it comes to stool studies. So Dr. Sagrellis, um, what would you recommend as the preferred strategy for stool testing? Do you have any preferences at this time? Depending on the, uh, what your lab does, I think you're restricted sometimes. Uh, I think a, um, 
I think if you have a PCR follow, uh, again, followed by EIA or GDH followed by EIA, EIA. Um, again, it's going to be, since he's immunocompromised and, again, three weeks of symptoms, I know this is a C. diff talk, but you want to look for subacute. Uh, so I, I think the cryptosporidium and Giardia antigens uh, for, for somebody with subacute diarrhea. And um, those will be the and cyclospora um, uh, testing, which is modified AFB. Uh, uh, so again, we have outbreaks of all of those. Um, the culture, uh, can you have salmonella, uh, et cetera? Sure, over three weeks is, is a little long. Um, but uh, I think all of those are, are reasonable. Okay. So we talked about therapeutic drug monitoring. Um, so, so Dr. Ferre, any, any advice on how to interpret therapeutic drug monitoring with superimposed infections? Oh, again, obviously, <clears throat> all bets are off. Uh, I want to know really, once I exclude an infection, then I'm really dealing with a flare of his ulcerative colitis. And again, he's been taking some non-steroidals that may be playing a role. We'll have him stop that. And then it depends on where he is in his cycle. Is he just due for his infliximab? Did he miss the previous one? Or was it delayed because he, he spent some time away from campus? And all that would help me kind of decide if I need to escalate his medical therapy. But we would just... Uh, I mean, obviously, we heard from David Rubin the, the other day that the easiest data to interpret would be a level of zero. But there are a lot of other, uh, a lot, a lot of other scenarios. So again, once I exclude infection, I'll get the therapeutic drug monitoring, assuming he's not C. diff positive or has one of these other things, and then adjust uh, dosing accordingly. Okay. Um, any thoughts about doing a procedure? I mean, I, I'm going to get the stool samples first, get the laboratory test. Um, and certainly, if I'm going to escalate medical therapy, I want some objective evidence. And I, would cert I can bring him in for a flexible sigmoidoscopy uh, the day he comes back from school if needed. That's why, again, if he was truly seven days away from coming back, I would try to get the data uh, before he comes back so I I'm ahead of the game. Any, any thoughts about imaging? It depends on what his physical exam shows. Again, if he's got stable vital signs and a benign abdomen, I don't think we need imaging in this case. This is a UC patient, um, and depending on how sick he is, I want the other information first. Okay, so we have some data coming back. So he's a little bit anemic. Hemoglobin is 11, so um, I always like to you know, remind myself that the normal hemoglobin for a man should be 13. Normal hemoglobin for a woman should be 12. We get all too co uh, comfortable with our IBD patients being chronically anemic. Um, C-reactive protein is coming back about six-fold elevated. Upper limit of normal is one. He's coming back at six. Albumin is clearly low, so he's got a few risk factors here. Um, as per usual, he did not do his stool studies because our patients are very naughty, and this is a 19-year-old college student, so we're not getting back any of our stool data that was requested. Um, with the blood test results, he's um, coming due for his infliximab, and he has a low trough level and a colonoscopy has already been set up. So that's getting geared up when he does come back from the college campus. We've held off on the imaging. So here's our colonoscopy findings. So, so Dr. Frey, could you give us any thoughts about how to interpret these images? Uh, obviously, he has pan ulcerative colitis. We don't have an image of the terminal ileum, but we'll assume his ileum has been intubated in the past. I mean, this is a Mayo 2 for sure. I'm trying to see if I see any deep ulcers and to make it a Mayo 3. So he's got Pan colitis, I'm not seeing pseudomembranes, but that doesn't make a difference. Um, I'm kind of surprised he was willing to kind of do the colonoscopy before the stool samples. Um, do you ever aspirate stool during a colonoscopy for someone who forgot to drop off their stool sample for either C. diff or any of the other things that we just heard about, or is that kind of a futile episode? Um, so, so we have historically done stool specimens. If it's an unprepped exam, for sure, because you're actually getting incredibly fresh material that can be sent directly to the laboratory. Um, there's been criticism because the assays are not FDA approved. They've never been tested on effluent coming from the colonoscopies. Um, but I would, actually, I would actually comment that there are a few findings on this scope that I'm a little suspicious about. Um, there's kind of an adherent, I'll use the word mucopus or adherent mucus um, throughout the colon. Um, we actually have uh, 
uh, been doing a few assays, or a few analyses, excuse me, on patients who've had C. difficile on their endoscopies, and pseudomembranes are not the most common finding. Adherent mucus actually was the most common finding with shallow ulcers. Not specific by any way, way or form, but that was significantly more in a matched control population in terms of disease severity for ulcerative colitis. So let's move on. So what do we want to do at this point? Any thoughts, uh, Dr. Frey, about how we're going to be treating this gentleman? I would have aspirated a stool sample from his <laughs> during the colonoscopy personally. Okay, so we have some choices I'm going to throw okay. at you. Are you going to start him on some prednisone yet? Yeah, again, you know, this is the perfect setup for you where you want to exclude C. diff before you escalate medical therapy. And we're talking about giving him an agent that's certainly going to be associated with potentially a worse outcome if you're superimposed having a CDI. So, you know, I would have aspirated stool during the colonoscopy. We okay. do use a PCR. I understand about the sensitivity and specificity. And we've got an awful large number of people who were positive. And then before he wakes up, or by the time he gets home later in the day, I'll have my PCR back and I can start treatment. So I, what are my other options here? So this man speaks with wisdom. Everyone listen to him. This is very important. <laughs> All right, number two, we're going to arrange for some higher infliximab dosing. All right, I'm not going to torment you anymore. I'm going to keep going. We're going to admit him to the hospital yet? Again, you know, he's certainly with a low albumin, uh, an anemia. He has to tell me, you know, how's he getting along? What is his abdominal exam like? Um, you know, it's, this is a guy who probably doesn't want to go into the hospital. Um, if he was ambulatory and I excluded C. diff, uh, I would be submitting the prior authorization for the higher dose of infliximab, and I probably would have to give him a, a short course of steroids unless I was able to get, the, get him you know, teed up for the next day to get his next dose. And maybe we should get those stool studies uh, finally. I, I've asked him to do it three times. <laughs> All right. Oh, look at this. Uh, we have a positive C. difficile analysis on our stool studies. All right, so now we're going to have to think about treating something. So um, we have a couple choices here. Um, we can give metronidazole, um, uh, 500 milligrams three times a day for 10 days. We have an option for Vanco, 125, uh, four times a day for 10 days. Fidaxomycin, 200 milligrams twice daily for 10 days. We can start the prednisone. And we have a few questions here. Do we want to hold the infliximab, maintain the infliximab, or increase the infliximab, hold the 6MP, maintain the 6MP? We're going to run out of time, but we're never going to have an answer here. So, Frank, what are your thoughts about next step? Um, again, we, we adhere to the new recommendations. We would give this guy vancomycin, the 125, orally, four times a day for the 10 days, or potentially, I would, if there was no issues, I probably would write him a prescription for 30 days, and that'll give me a little bit of leeway if I want to play around with the dose or extend the dose based on how he's doing. Uh, in this particular scenario, I would probably hold the 6MP, because I'm not sure it's doing very much, and then I have to make the decision. If he's truly due for his infliximab tomorrow, and it's a Monday, I'm, I might say, look, let's put off the infliximab and treat you for your C. diff, and then reassess, as I showed you in that algorithm, if he's not getting better after 48 hours, then I think that I've, I will continue the C. diff treatment, but then I have to escalate. And I certainly think escalating, this is controversial, I think that escalating infliximab is probably safer than giving him steroids in the setting of C. diff. So um, uh, the take home from this slide is metronidazole is not recommended for IBD patients. So we heard that the IDSA guidelines have taken off metronidazole because it's not as efficacious an agent. Um, that's even more true in the IBD patient population. So we have case series that have been published for the, from a number of uh, hospital centers that vancomycin is a superior drug in the IBD patient population. It resulted in lower mortality at Cedars-Sinai when they looked at their hospital experience. So um, fidaxomycin is an excellent antibiotic. It's hard for us to get access to in the GI community. Um, but I think in this type of a patient, it would be totally appropriate. Efficacy is outstanding, and there's also the potential for less microbial disruption as a result of the antibiotic therapy. And IBD patients have microbial disruption to begin with. All right, the patient's improving within three days of starting oral vancomycin. He completes the course. Infliximab is administered one week into the vanco course as he's had a clear, clear uh, beneficial response from the vanco. He's actually picked up his 6MP prescription and started to take it on a daily basis, but he gets diarrhea back after the vancomycin is stopped. Frank, you've never seen this before? A few times. <laughs> That's why I gave him the prescription probably 
again, off-label, of having 30 days of medicine, you know, 120 tablets, so I can potentially just say restart it and not submit another prior authorization if, if necessary. But I would, we see this a lot. All right, any thoughts about retesting the stool at this point? What do you think, uh, Constantine? Uh, yeah, I always uh, want to confirm a diagnosis, so I would resubmit C. diff testing just to make sure. Yeah, I think, I think redoing the stool yeah. testing is worthwhile yeah. because for fighting insurance companies, actually having that positive test result will actually open up some doors. So. And if he had a negative test, then you would say, well, although his diary is coming back, well, maybe that, that level of four, that trough is too low. And I don't recall if we changed his dose or not, or we gave him the same dose. But it would help me to kind of decide if I think the C. diff is playing a role or not. Okay, so the stool tests were sent off. It's a good idea to get it, even though it's a pain. We have to torture our patients to get the tests done. Um, he's positive again. So he hasn't cleared the infection, and it's been, uh, again, we have a GDH, different hospital system. He's got toxin detected, so it's the real thing. We feel fairly confident we're dealing with an, a superimposed infection. Now what should we do? Any thoughts about treating recurrent C. difficile in an immunocompromised IBD patient on 6MP and Remicade? Dr. Sagrales, any thoughts about what you'd like to do in an ideal world? You, got, you have several options here. I think uh, you know, fidaxomycin would be an option. If covered, uh, uh, you could do a second course of vancomycin, uh, vancomycin taper. I don't think there's one right option. I think this might be a good scenario for fidaxomycin if you if, again if you can if it's uh, if it's covered. Okay, we're going to move on. So treatment options for recurrent C diff: fidaxomycin, 200 milligrams time day, uh, twice a day for 10 days. Uh, the vanco four times a day, followed by the pulse taper. We can actually think about bezlituximab. That's an IgG1 backbone antibody that can be given after antibiotic response as a way to again hopefully decrease the risk of recurrence. And the IBD patient population, C. diff recurrence rates are actually quite a bit higher. 34 to 50% is not unexpected with the first C. diff infection. And that's data coming from the University of Toronto and data we've had from uh, Medical College of Wisconsin in the past. So we're talking about a, mu a much higher risk uh, population than the general population. And there's a little bit of data that sn uh, snuck out of the Modify 1 and 2 trials when it came to Beslo. There were about 40 patients with IBD who snuck into those trials, even though they were sh probably should have been excluded. And Beslo did more or less cut the recurrence rate in half. Um, he, should he go straight to FMT at this time? Frank, what for, do you want? For the first recurrence, I will give another course. Okay. I would probably just for in terms of in my area, I can probably get the Vanco approved easier, and I would do the, the 10 days in a taper before I try to the Bezlo or try to fight the Fidoxamycin. In general, we do FMT after the second relapse. Okay. All right, so we're going to wrap things up with this case. He admits he's had a hard time taking pills. Um, he prefers IV treatments. He likes infliximab and feels better with each treatment. He has a lot of confidence in IV medicine. He's just had a colonoscopy and doesn't like them, and he doesn't want another one for an FMT. Um, he doesn't, also does not want to have any more C. diff. He really hurt his school performance, and he didn't like having fecal incontinence, and he had to withdraw from one of his classes, and he definitely does not want a colectomy. So if you want to motivate your patients with inflammatory bowel disease, explain that this is serious business and surgery might be on the horizon. So he opts for fidaxomycin. It got covered. We were lucky in this situation, and he was going to be on the 200 milligram standard dose twice daily for 10 days, and he actually was super lucky because he was able to get a bezlituximab infusion. So this is going to be case one. I think we'll skip the second case for t purpose of time.